Okay, chapter 25. This is the urinary system. We'll be covering the anatomy and the physiology of the urinary system throughout this presentation. The kidneys function as a filtration system for the blood. <clears throat> they filter 180 to 200 liters of fluid from the blood every day. And what they do is they're removing a number of things, toxins, metabolic waste, uh, excess ions like potassium, things like that. Uh, another function for kidneys is that it helps regulate blood volume and the chemical composition of the blood. It also will help regulate the pH. We'll see how there is a uh, pH buffer system for the, that the kidneys have. And uh, glucone gluconeogenesis is the formation of glucose from a non-carbohydrate source. The kidneys can stimulate that process. And then we already learned a couple of other things about the kidneys already, that they release renin. It causes that whole renin-angiotensin cascade that we'll talk about again in this chapter. And then we learned in the blood chapter that the kidneys release a hormone called erythropoietin that increases erythropoiesis, which increases the red blood cell formation. And then we also said when we talked about vitamin D that the activation of vitamin D, uh, we need the kidneys to do that, right? To, to turn it from that, uh, an, an inactive form into an active form, which was the 1,25 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D. If you look, you can see that the right kidney is a little bit lower because you've got the liver on the right side. So it's actually offset a little bit. And surrounding the kidney, you have this capsule called the fibrous capsule or the renal capsule, and that is designed to prevent the spread of infection to the kidney. So the flow of urine goes like this. It gets formed as we go through this filtration system that we're gonna talk about uh, called the nephron. And then it's going to drain through uh, this collecting duct that moves out of a renal papilla from the pyramid into a minor callosy or calyx, into a major calyx, and then into what's called the renal pelvis. That drains into the ureter, and that goes all the way down to the urinary bladder. This just gives you a nice visualization of those uh, calluses, as well as uh, those renal pyramids and even the blood vessels. If we're memorizing the flow of blood vessels, this is a nice chart to go ahead and do that, so you can look at your PowerPoint notes for that as well. Now, we said the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. And this is what's going to be, there's, there's about, well, there's more than a million per kidney. And these are the, the, um, the functional units that are going to filter uh, the blood, okay? So this is where we're going to form this stuff called filtrate, which we're going to talk about. And there's two parts of the nephron. We have the renal corpuscle, which I'm going to explain, and then we have these tubules. <clears throat> now, when we're looking at the renal corpuscle, it's made up of two parts. You have this tuft of capillaries called the glomerulus. These are going to be very... Um, very porous capillaries and we're gonna again what's gonna happen is we're gonna have uh, filtrate formation which I'll explain the process in just a little bit and then the other part of the renal corpuscle is the capsule that contains the glomerulus it's called the Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule and there's gonna be little slits in that capsule called filtration slits where we can get uh, the, the blood plasma is gonna go through to get into that tubule system now, I'm going to show you a picture on the next slide here, but when we're talking about going from the blood into the tubules of the kidneys, and we're always going to be talking about two environments. The environment is either going to be the filtrate, which will, whatever stays in those tubules will become urine, and the plasma. And we'll be manipulating this fluid throughout the entire nephron, and we'll talk about some of those details. But the layers to get into, so are out of the blood, into those, uh, those tubules or into that glomerular capsule. First, we have to get out of... The, uh, the porous endothelium of the capillaries in the, of the glomerulus. So we gotta get out of those porous capillaries. So we move through the endothelial wall. Then we move through this gel-like substance called the basement membrane. And then we move through this, the filtration slits, which are made up of these podocytes, they're called. And uh, once we get through the filtration slits, then you're in the Bowman's capsule, which connects to the proximal convoluted tubule, and the fluid will move through there. So this slide gives you the visualization. You can see the blood plasma. You can see the wall of the capillary with the pores. Uh, the the plasma is going to move through there, through that gray thing there. That's the basement membrane, that gel-like substance. Through those podocytes, those yellow things are the podocytes that create filtration slits to get into the Bowman's capsule. Okay, um, and I'll and I'll give you more details on this process uh, in just a little bit here. But what you have to understand is this system of filtration doesn't allow you know, cells to get through. It doesn't allow large particles to get through or proteins, things like that. 
So it's going to be very specific. So we shouldn't have things like protein ending up in the urine uh, because they shouldn't really be getting into the capsule. And so remember, whatever uh, the filtrate will become urine. So whatever is in those tubules at the end of the nephron, you know, and in this thing called a collecting duct, uh, that is going to become urine. Now I'm going to draw a picture and I'm going to show you some of this stuff on the picture, but we have to under, you know, establish a couple of principles. So it won't, won't make sense just yet, but then you can go back and kind of replay this after I've gone through all of it. And so we have a, a system set up here that we don't even need to use energy to, for this filtration process. And so the, the, the system is set up to create a pressure system inside the glomerulus, that tuft of leaky capillaries, right? Those porous or fenestrated capillaries. And so what you have is the afferent arteriole goes into the glomerulus and the efferent arteriole exits the glomerulus. Well, the afferent is larger than the efferent. So if we have a bigger tube going in, sending blood into this tuft of capillaries and a little tube going out, what's going to happen? It's gonna create pressure on the inside, right? Because not as much fluid can go out as is coming in. So it's gonna create pressure inside. Well, these are porous capillaries in the glomerulus. So it's gonna force the fluid or the plasma out of that endothelial wall that we just talked about. Another thing you should understand is these arterioles are high resistance vessels. Why is that important? Well, it means that they're gonna resist pressure. So in other words, the afferent arterial is gonna send this blood in and the smaller efferent arterial will drain it and it's high resistance, so it's not gonna stretch. It's gonna actually maintain its, its, you know, um, its shape. Uh, and, and because if it stretched, think what, what would happen? If, if we had a big tube going in, a little tube that can stretch going out, well, then we don't really create pressure on this in the center, right? So we wind up having almost as much fluid uh, going out as in, and then we don't really create this, uh, this pressure on the inside that's going to be necessary to force the fluid out of those capillaries. Now this is a one-way system, right? We're creating pressure inside, so things are only moving from inside the capillaries to out in this particular section of the nephron. All right, so what does this mean, uh, passive process? Well, glomerular filtration, which is what we're talking about here, and I'm gonna give you a detailed illustration in just a moment. The pa it's a passive process, which means it doesn't require energy, okay? What else? It's talking about this, the pressure we just talked about on the last slide, hydrostatic forces being created by big tube in, little tube out. Now, no reabsorption into the capillaries of the glomerulus. What does this mean? Well, if you remember from past lectures, reabsorption always means going back into the blood. In this section, we're only going out of the blood. No reabsorption, which means nothing's getting going back into the capillaries at this point. Why? Well, because there's a pressure gradient, right? There's force pushing the plasma out of the glomerulus, out of those capillaries. And so nothing's gonna go against that gradient. Okay, so we're almost there where I'm gonna show you specifics on glomerular filtration, but this gives you the visualization of the renal corpuscle that contains the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule, and then the entire tubule system, which goes proximal convoluted tubule, which is connected to the glomerular, the glomerular capsule, then the descending loop of Henle, ascending loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule into that thing that looks like a tree branch there called the collecting duct. So now let's go over what we're gonna talk about here, this glomerular filtration, taking some of the stuff we just talked about and looking at it in a little bit more detail. Okay, so I drew some things on this slide. Let's go through it. You see at the top, I said not. So this is not what the glomerulus is. It's not a bowl that this tuft of capillaries is sitting in. We squeeze the fluid and boom, it just, it just drains right into the bowl. And sometimes the pictures in the books, textbooks and things like that look uh, similar to that. The picture on the bottom is a more accurate depiction because it shows you the membranes and, and a little bit more detail on the structure. So let's look at it. The top red, that is the afferent arterial going into the tuft of capillaries and the bottom red coming out is the efferent arterial. And inside that glomerular capsule, we can see the, the squiggly tuft of capillaries there. And then the green thing, that's the basement membrane. And then the black with the little slits in it, those are the filtration slits. So what we have happening is we have plasma moving out of the glomerulus through that green thing, the basement membrane, through those filtration slits, and now it's blue. And that blue is representing filtrate. That's the stuff we're forming. And we're gonna manipulate this stuff so to at the end, it's gonna be less than 99% of what it actually started out as. And we'll talk more about that. A Couple other things I wanna, I wanna illustrate here. 
As we move through, now we already said glomerular filtration is a one-way process. We're going from the capillaries, that plasma is moving through the three membranes into the glomerulus, which gets into that beginning squiggly portion called the proximal convoluted tubule. That's going to go down the loop of Henle, up the loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule into the collecting duct. Now, we're going to manipulate this fluid throughout the entire process. So some stuff might have been squeezed out because this is nonspecific. It's just pressure, so it forced stuff out. So some stuff may have been squeezed out that we didn't want squeezed out, let's say like glucose. So we're going to have transporters to bring glucose back in to reabsorb it. Remember, reabsorption means going back into the blood. From where? From the tubules. Um, let's say we didn't get rid of some stuff, like some uric acid or urea or nitrogenous waste or whatever it is. Well, then we can secrete stuff, and that's going to be from... Uh, secreting it from the blood into the tubules. So stuff that maybe didn't get squeezed out in glomerular filtration that we wanted to get out into the tubules so we can get rid of it in urine. Now, another thing I want to point out is that as we go down the loop of Henle, you see my H2Os, um, and you see the arrow going from the tubule back into the blood. So those are the red surrounding the tubules. Those are representing peritubular capillaries, the capillaries that surround the tubules. Now, those are very low pressure because we want to be able to move fluids into and out of them, okay? So into the tubules, from the blood, out of the tubules, into the blood, so we're going to go back and forth. Now, you can see that we reabsorb water down the loop of Henle, okay? So which means what? It means we take it from the tubule and put it into the blood. Going up the loop of Henle, you can see we're moving some electrolytes. It is impermeable to water, so we're no longer pulling water out up the loop of Henle, okay? We're pulling out some electrolytes and things like that, and then we'll continue to manipulate the fluid until we get into that collecting duct where we can do a little bit of manipulation of some of it and then eventually uh, it will be urine as it goes uh, through the pathway we talked about earlier in the chapter. Now the proximal convolute tubule functions in both reabsorption and secretion. In fact, if we compare the PCT, the proximal convolute tubule, to every other part of the nephron, it does more reabsorption and secretion than anything else. But if we are comparing it to itself, it, re, it does more reabsorption than it actually does secretion, okay? So just to make sure we're clear on that. But both reabsorption and secretion, most of it's happening in this proximal convoluted tubule, although we will continue to do other reabsorption and secretion throughout the nephron. Now, the, ne the, the loop of Henle I already mentioned, the descending limb is permeable to water, so we're pulling water back into the blood. Uh, the, the ascending limb is not, and we're going to pull some electrolytes back in as we go up the loop of Henle. The distal convoluted tubule, comparing it to itself, functions more in secretion than reabsorption. It doesn't function more in secretion than, let's say, the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule, but when we compare it to itself, it's going to do more secretion than reabsorption. Another thing you want to know here, we'll talk about later again, is that reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule is hormonally controlled. What does that mean? That means we need a specific hormone in order to cause reabsorption at this point in the nephron. And lastly is that collecting duct that's going to receive the filtrate from a number of nephrons. And again, that filtrate will become urine and then we'll get it, you know, out of the, the uh, through the renal papilla, minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, into the ureter like we explained earlier. Now there's two different types of nephrons. We have a cortical nephron, which makes up 85% of the nephrons, and then the other 15% are these juxtamedullary nephrons. And the difference we'll see on the next picture is that the juxtamedullary nephron has a long loop of Henle that dives deep into the medulla. And um, remember what we said. We said as we go down the loop of Henle, we reabsorb water. What does that mean? That means we take water out of the tubule and put it into the blood. Well, whatever stays in the tubule becomes urine. So if we're taking water out of the tubule, what are we doing? We're actually concentrating the filtrate, which is going to produce concentrated urine. Here you can see the two different types of nephrons. On the left, we have the cortical nephron, and on the right, we have the juxtamedullary nephron with the long loop of Henle. Now, surrounding all of the tubules, it doesn't really show it on the loop of Henle on the left or on the tubules at the top of the juxtamedullary nephr nephron on this picture, but all of the tubules are surrounded by capillaries, and they're usually called peritubular capillaries. However, if it's, if it's surrounding the long loop of Henle of the juxtamedullary nephron, it is called vasorecta. It's these long straight vessels that are specialized for concentrating urine. So this is talking about the peritubular capillaries, how they are low pressure. Uh, that's the key thing that you want to understand here. And we can do reabsorption and secretion. That's really what I want you to focus on for peritubular capillaries.
This slide talks about the Vasorecta, which translates as straight vessels. And um, it, it, it's going around those juxtamedullary loops of Henle. And we said that the juxtamedullary nephron, or we're gonna say, we're gonna talk about that their function is to concentrate urine. We talked about on the other slide, right? Well, the vasorecta, which is part of that, is also, it has a function of concentrating urine. That's actually the special, one of the specializations. The long loop of Henle plus these long straight vessels allows for us to pull lots of water back in from these loops of Henle. This is just an additional picture to show you that the capillaries do surround all the tubules so that you can kind of see it on both the right side juxtamodulary nef nephron and left side the cortical nephron. Now there is a structure called a juxtaglomerular apparatus or juxtaglomerular complex and there's one per nephron and it's, this is gonna be important for the regulation of the filtrate formation or the rate of filtrate formation uh, also in regulating um, blood pressure, okay? And so let's look at the components of that juxtaglomerular complex. We will look at the picture on the next slide, but right here we see the three different types of cells uh, that we're gonna be focused on mainly in this juxtaglomerular complex. The macula densa cells, which are chemoreceptors that sense sodium chloride concentrations in the filtrate. That's gonna be very important later for the physiology. Granular cells, which are called JG cells or juxtaglomerular cells. These are the same ones that produce that enzyme called renin that we talked about before and we'll talk about again in this chapter. Um, but these cells are also mechanoreceptors that sense the stretch. So as blood pressure changes in the afferent arterial, we can sense whether it's going higher or lower based on the stretch. And then there's extra uh, glomerular mesenglial cells and those pass signals between these two different types of cells, the macula densa and the granular cells. So this gives us the visualization of the cells. Okay, if you see here in red, I outlined the, um, the granular cells that are surrounding the afferent arteriole, okay? And then you can see um, I outlined in blue, okay, which are the gray cells there called the extra glomerular mesenglial cells. And last but not least, I, I outlined in purple the macula densa cells. So we talked about all those on the other slide, but now you can visualize where they're at. Now we've got three processes here. We've got glomerular filtration, which we went over on that slide, right? Talking about going out of the glomerulus, you know, through um, the endothelium of the, glom the glomerular capillaries, basement membrane, filtration slits, right? That was glomerular filtration. Then I mentioned secretion and reabsorption. Now it's called tube, this is where it gets a little confusing, but we wanna make sure we don't get confused. When we say reabsorption, it always means into the blood. So tubular reabsorption sounds like we're absorbing into the tubules, we're not. It's from the tubules into the blood. We return about 99% of the substances from the filtrate <clears throat> uh, through this process of tubular reabsorption. Tubular secretion is going from blood to tubules. So we're secreting stuff from the blood into the tubules, again, manipulating that filtrate. All right, so this picture gives you uh, a good, uh, just a visualization of the three processes. Just remember, I don't like this picture because the glomerular filtration, it looks like we're squeezing stuff out of the capillaries and it's dropping into a bowl, but we know it's not like that. We've got those filtration slits that are not visualized here. Each day, we're gonna filter the entire uh, volume of your plasma 60 times. And so that, remember that number. And uh, we're forming filtrate, right, as we, as we go through the process. And again, whatever remains as filtrate in the tubules becomes urine. And if we look at that, less than 1% of the original filtrate is, what's made, is what the urine is made up of, okay? Now what is the glomerular filtration rate? It's the amount of filtrate that we are forming per minute. And there's three factors that affect that. The, the primary factor or the most important factor controlling the, uh, the glomerular filtration rate is something called net filtration pressure, okay? There's also, um, the total surface area for filtration can change based on contracting of certain types of cells. And so if we have a larger surface area, we have more diffusion, right? So that would actually increase filtration and the opposite is true as well. Filtration, uh, membrane permeability. If we increase permeability, then we have more filtration. We decrease permeability, less filtration. And so these three factors are gonna affect how much filtrate we're forming per minute. But again, the net filtration pressure is gonna be the main controlling factor. We have two types of mechanisms for controlling glomerular filtration rate. One is called renal autoregulation. This is an intrinsic control. It acts within the kidney. And then we have extrinsic controls where we're going to recruit the nervous system and some hormones 
to help uh, you know, control this filtration rate. Now, the intrinsic controls are going to be uh, active when the mean arterial pressure is between 80 and 180. And when it goes outside those ranges, so less than 80 or above 180 for the mean arterial pressure, then the extrinsic controls kick in to try and help regulate this glomerular filtration rate. So this slide is talking about uh, the two mechanisms that we use for renal, renal autoregulation, the myogenic mechanism, which is going to have to do with stretch receptors, I'll talk about each of these, and then the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism, which is gonna be a chemoreceptor-based feedback. And again, as I said, between 80 and 180 millimeters of mercury for your mean arterial pressure, that's when these intrinsic controls are going to be able to regulate the glomerular filtration rate. Now let's think about this for a second. Why do we need to regulate how much filtrate we're forming per minute? Well, if we're moving too fast through the tubules, okay, what's going to happen is we're not going to be able to pull from the tubules into the blood some of the stuff we wanted to reabsorb, right? Some of the good stuff like the glucose and maybe sodium and whatever, whatever else we were trying to reabsorb, okay? Um, if we are moving too slow, we actually may reabsorb too much of things we don't want to reabsorb. Maybe some of, the, some of the waste products or ions that we didn't want to reabsorb, that we want to get rid of because they were excess in the blood. So that's why we want to regulate the flow of how much filtrate we're forming per minute because if it's, again, if it's too fast, then we can't, pull, we can't reabsorb some of the things we need to. If it's too slow, then we're maybe reabsorbing stuff that's, there are toxins or things that we didn't want in the blood we wanted to get rid of. All right, so you can read this slide, but let's just kind of talk through it as well. So if the, if the blood pressure systemically increases, it's going to increase stretch. So we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna go down to the local area of the kidney and specifically to a nephron where we have an afferent arterial going in. So if the systemic blood pressure is increased, what's gonna happen to the, remember we had mechanoreceptors, right, around the afferent arterial that are gonna send stretch and so I outlined those for you in the juxtaglomerular complex. And if the blood pressure is higher, we're gonna stretch more, right? So what's my response to that muscle stretch? Well, if you remember locally, in order to control flow, we will vasoconstrict or dilate locally to control the flow, right? So if the blood pressure is, is higher systemically, that means it's forcing the blood more into the afferent arteriole, which means we might get too much or increase the flow, the glomerular filtration, too much. So what's my response? To vasoconstrict the afferent arteriole, make it smaller, the tube, so that less blood gets through, right? So that it regulates the flow, okay? Because if I leave the pressure high, if the pressure is high, we're not gonna change pressure by changing local blood vessel diameter, but we can change flow. So if we're pushing, right, we have the pressure turned up and we're pushing with more force, more blood's gonna get in there, but if I make the tube smaller, then it brings the amount of blood getting in there back down to normal limits. If the opposite is true, the systemic blood pressure is low, that means we're gonna get less stretch on the, the mechanoreceptors around the afferent arteriole, and what's gonna happen? Well, it's basically saying, hey, we're not pushing enough blood in, so the glomerular filtration rate's gonna to be too slow, so let's open up the blood vessel diameter locally to increase flow. And as we do that, then we bring the glomerular filtration rate back up. So these are, this is the, the myogenic mechanism, right? This has to do with mechanoreceptors and responding with either vasoconstriction or vasodilation to regulate the flow of blood into that afferent arteriole, right? Because the more blood that gets in there, the faster the glomerular filtration rate, the less blood, the, the you know, slower the filtration rate. Now the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism has the exact same two responses. I'm either gonna vasoconstrict or vasodilate the, the afferent arterial, okay? But the stimulus is different. It's not the stretch receptors giving you the stimulus, it's, it's a, a chemoreceptors doing it. Remember the macula densa cells? We said they sent sodium chloride concentration in the filtrate, which means in the tubules, okay? So if the glomerular filtration rate is too high, well, that means it says, say it's going too fast. What's going to happen? Well, if it's going too fast, you're gonna see there's too much sodium chloride in the filtrate, why? We said if we go too fast, we can't pull stuff out of the filtrate, right? We can't reabsorb it back into the blood. So the sodium chloride concentration in that case is gonna to be too high. So what do we do? Well, if it's too high, it means we're going too fast, right? Because we're not pulling it out. 
So we need to slow it down. How do we slow down the flow? We need to vasoconstrict the afferent arterial, okay? The opposite's also true. The glomerular filtration rate is too low. What are we gonna have? Well, we're gonna have too little sodium chloride concentration. Okay, well, if there's too little, what do we have to do? We have to speed it up a little bit. And so what do we do? To, how do we fix that? We vasodilate the afferent arterial, and then uh, that will again, um, you know, regulate the sodium chloride concentration. All right, let's look at an extrinsic control. Right, we said extrinsic is outside of the ranges of 80 to 180 of the mean arterial pressure. So let's say that you have the um, blood volume is very low, which means the blood pressure is going to be low. What's going to happen is your sympathetic nervous system is going to become activated. It's going to release epinephrine, right? We cause a release of epinephrine when we activate the sympathetic nervous system. That's going to cause systemic vasoconstriction, right? Because that's what epinephrine does, one of the things it does. And when we, can, when we vasoconstrict the entire container, right, all the blood vessels systemically, we increase the blood pressure. Now, what happens when we have increased blood pressure at the afferent arterial? It's going to constrict, right, because it's going, we want to decrease uh, the glomerular filtration rate at that point. And by doing that, remember, whatever we filtrate, right, the more filtrate we have, the more we could lose in urine. So we want to not do that, right, in this case, because we started off with low blood volume. So what we're doing is we're constricting the afferent arterioles to decrease the glomerular filtration rate. By doing that, less fluid is lost, which means the blood volume increases. And by the blood volume increasing, the blood pressure increases. A hormonal mechanism uh, in, in the extrinsic controls is... Um, this is for increasing blood pressure um, as well, but what's going to happen is those um, granular cells, the ones I told you, release renin. Okay, remember, they're the renin is going to be released. This is a cascade we've seen before, but let's run through it. You have a blood protein made by the liver called angiotensinogen. Renin is going to convert that to angiotensin 1 when we release the renin. Right? What's releasing, why are the kidneys releasing renin? Well, this is stimulated by low blood pressure, right? So low blood pressure triggers the kidneys to release renin. Renin converts angiotensin 1 to angio, uh, sorry, angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And then from the lungs, we have that angiotensin converting enzyme, which is going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 has the four primary effects I want you to, be, to, to know. And we've memorized these before, but let's run through them again. All right, so what are the effects of angiotensin II? Well, there's a short-term mechanism where we systemically vasoconstrict because angiotensin II is a vasoconstrictor, and by doing that systemically, we raise the blood pressure short-term. We have three mechanisms, so I, you saw I wrote four down there just to separate that last one activating the thirst center of the hypothalamus. So that's one of them, right? So when we activate the thirst center of the hypothalamus, we drink more fluid, we get more fluid in the blood, that means more volume, more volume means more pressure. What are the other two? Well, two and three talk about triggering the release of aldosterone, which increases sodium reabsorption. And as sodium goes back into the blood, it facilitates the movement of water back into the blood, which facilitates the increased blood volume, which, in, which um, as we increase blood volume, again, we increase blood pressure. Now, you've also got the release of ADH. Well, ADH increases reabsorption of water. So the, the, again, the, the aldosterone and ADH are working together. As we reabsorb more water, more volume, more volume, more pressure. So two, three, and four are all increasing the blood volume, increasing the blood pressure. The first one increases the blood pressure short term, right? Long term is when we change volume. Short term is simply when we do this systemic vasoconstriction to temporarily raise the blood pressure. But these are the four effects of angiotensin II, so make sure you know those. Okay, so sodium reabsorption is by primary active transport. If you remember primary active transport, that means we need a transporter protein, but we also need ATP, right? This is active transport, so we need energy to move sodium. The thing is, is primary active transport creates secondary active transport, and that's where not only are we moving a positive ion across, which will attract negative ions, but we're moving sodium across, increasing the concentration gradient on the side we're moving it to, right? So it can draw uh, water to it as well, so it increases osmosis to that side. So when you look at secondary active transport, we got things like glucose, amino acids, ions, vitamins that'll be transported without additional ATP, as well as, I think I have it on the next slide, as well as water through osmosis. This slide talks about the osmosis or the osmotic gradient. Remember, 
what is osmosis? It's, it's essentially the water moving to the more concentrated side, okay? It'll always move to the more concentrated side. Think, that, think of it this way, water always likes to dilute. So if we move sodium over to one side, water likes to follow it. And um, there is, uh, there's two types of water reabsorption. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, you have what's called obligatory water reabsorption, which means you're always going to absorb water there. Um, and then we have, because uh, there's aquaporins in there, by the way, these little aquaporins are protein channels that help us reabsorb that water. Uh, facultative water reabsorption happens uh, in the collecting ducts, and that's if we have ADH. We're going to build little aquaporins, little channels in the collecting ducts to facilitate additional water reabsorption. Remember what I said before about the distal convoluted tubule? Well, distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts any reabsorption there is going to be hormonally controlled. So without a hormone, we're not going to reabsorb that substance. ADH, if it's present, we're going to reabsorb water at the collecting duct as long as we have that hormone present. So additional water will go back into the blood. If we don't have that hormone, then that, that additional water will not go back into the blood. But we do absorb water as we saw down the loop of Henle, lots of it in the proximal convoluted tubule. So we're still going to be absorbing lots of water but the facultative water reabsorption is additional to the obligatory water reabsorption. Now for substances, we have carriers. And so for every, uh, you know, for every reabsorbed substance we have, we have a certain number of carriers. And then if we saturate those carriers, then we can no longer bring that substance across. So this is what we call a transport maximum. So let's say we have these transporters for glucose. Well, if there's a lot of glucose in those tubules, and we try to transport it back into the blood, if we saturate those carriers or we hit that transport maximum, we're not gonna be able to bring more glucose back from the tubules into the blood, so some of it ends up in the tubules. So someone that has hyperglycemia ends up with not only high blood sugar, but that, that blood sugar ends up in the urine because we're unable to bring it all back through reabsorption. All right, some more detail here. Now, we already said that the, the proximal convoluted tubule is the site of most reabsorption. Some specific numbers I want you to know. There's lots of stuff we reabsorb here, so I'm not going to have you memorize all, you know, all the details, but I do want you to know that 65% of your sodium and 65% of your water that got squeezed out in glomerular filtration goes back in to the blood at the proximal convoluted tubule. So we're reabsorbing 65% of water and sodium here. Water uh, gets reabsorbed down the descending loop of Henle. And then some solutes, as we mentioned before, get reabsorbed as we ascend the loop of Henle. At the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, reabsorption is hormonally regulated. So if we have ADH, we're going to reabsorb more water at the distal convoluted tubule and at the collecting duct. If we don't, then we won't reabsorb it here in these two, two, two places. If we have aldosterone, aldosterone increases sodium reabsorption. Where does it do it? It does it at the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. If you don't have aldosterone, you don't reabsorb sodium in these, these two places. Uh, PTH, that's parathyroid hormone. It increases calcium reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. We're going to reabsorb these things throughout the nephron, but once we get to the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, we need hormones for reabsorption and a hormone for each specific you know, nutrient or whatever, substance, water, whatever. Atrial natriuretic peptide, ANP, that's, that's the opposite is of, of aldosterone in the sense that it decreases sodium reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. Now, how about tubular secretion? Well, this is where we are going to secrete things from the blood into um, the, uh, the tubules, and most of this is happening at the proximal convoluted tubule. I mentioned that in the beginning. Most reabsorption and most secretion are happening at the proximal convoluted tubule in that beginning portion. Uh, what are some things that we would uh, secrete? Well, what if we have excess hydrogen ions? That's one thing, right? Or bicarbonate ions, excess potassium, uh, NH4, I believe is ammonia. So we have ammonia, creatinine, which is nitrogenous waste, ure urea and uric acid, which are nitrogenous waste, certain drugs. So these are a number of things that if it didn't get squeezed out at glomerular filtration, we will secrete into the, the tubules from the blood so that we can get rid of it, right? Get it out, filter it out through the urine.
Now we need to understand the concept of osmolality or osmolarity. They're the same thing essentially, just different measures. So the number of solute particles in one kilogram of water we call osmolality. Osmolarity is the solute particles per one liter of water. So again, different measures of the same thing. What they're saying is with osmolarity or osmolality, which I'll use these terms interchangeably, is it's the concentration of the solution, right? So of the, or of the dissolved particles in the solution. And so the, the higher the osmolality, which means the more particles, the more ability it has to draw water to it. All right, so if we have overhydration, it's gonna cause a large volume, which is gonna create dilute urine, why? Well, we're gonna decrease ADH production, right? ADH blocks diuresis, so we're gonna block the thing that blocks diuresis so we can diurese, which means the formation of urine. And the more urine we form, the more we can get rid of, so we, we decrease um, that volume of water, right? If we have dehydration, then we're gonna secrete ADH, right? Because what does ADH do? It blocks that diuresis. It blocks the formation of urine, which we want in a dehydrated state because we wanna reabsorb the water. And if you have ADH secreted, uh, we can reabsorb up to 99% of the water. So what's a diuretic? It's a chemical that increases diuresis, which is the formation of urine. So ADH inhibitors are one category of diuretic, which alcohol would be an example of that. It blocks ADH. If we block the thing that blocks diuresis, we diurese more, right? We have sodium reabsorption inhibitors, things like caffeine, certain dr drugs for blood high blood pressure or edema, and those uh, are gonna uh, block sodium reabsorption. And if we block sodium from going back into the blood, it stays in the tubules, and then water stays with it and leaves with it. Osmotic diuretics, things like um, substances that don't get reabsorbed um, so the water stays with it. For example, like high glucose levels in the, uh, in the tubules cause water to stay in the tubules, and so there's, it, this acts as a diuretic as well. Renal clearance is a test I want you to be aware of. So the volume of plasma in your kidneys can clear a particular substance in a given time. So we use this test to see if there's any kind of damage to the glomerulus, or we can even use it to uh, follow the progress of a renal disease, or maybe even a treatment to that renal disease. And so um, the, the, the renal clearance test determines the glomerular filtration rate of that specific substance. So again, we can see if it's working properly, this, this filtration process, or if the glomerulus is working properly or not. Two other tests for the kidney function are blood urea and nitrogen. Nitrogen is a, 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 a part of urea that results from catabolism and breakdown or deamination of amino acids. And so if that uh, builds, we, we usually flush out urea. So if, blood, if urea is building up in the blood, that's indicative of a kidney problem where we're not flushing it out. Creatinine is a waste product of breaking down creatine phosphate. And so our plasma creatine levels um, that would result, in, you know, or show renal dysfunction as well if those levels rise too high because we should be flushing out the creatinine, which is another uh, key nitrogenous waste. The pH of your blood is approximately 6. The range of normal is somewhere between 4.5 and 8. And uh, what you take in dietarily can change the pH of your blood as well. Specific gravity is really just the solute concentration of your, blood, of your urine. Most of your urine is made up of water, 95%. The other 5% are solutes. The three uh, key or, or large nitrogenous waste that you're gonna have are urea, which we say is a breakdown product from, from amino acids, um, and then uh, uric acid, which is a, a byproduct of nucleic acid metabolism, and then creatinine, which is a metabolite of creatine phosphate. And what I didn't say before is, you know, we, we have this ammonia when we break down proteins that we ship to the liver and it goes through the urea cycle. And so we create that urea that normally the kidneys can flush out. Just a key anatomical point, we have the ureters that come down from the kidneys into the posterior superior aspect of the bladder. And what's gonna happen is um, they, when the pressure builds up in the bladder, it closes the ends of the ureters. This way we don't get backflow of urine into those ureters back up to the kidney. All right, kidney stones, also known as renal calculi. Uh, I won't hold you responsible for percentages, but understand that the calcium oxalate is, is by far the most common type of kidney stones. The danger of kidney stones is they can block the ureter, uh, cause uh, pressure and pain and even infection into the kidneys. Some risk factors for kidney stones, chronic bacterial infection, dehydration, so drinking water is one of the key preventatives for this. 
uh, urine retention, uh, increased pH of the urine, also increased calcium in the blood. Now this doesn't say increased calcium intake, because remember your blood calcium is tightly regulated by parathyroid hormone. So if there's a dysfunction in parathyroid hormone, or let's say you take massive amounts of vitamin D, you know, high, high levels, 10,000 IU and above, where you get your blood levels above 100, then you might have hypercalcemia. And that then, of course, at that point, kidney stones would be a risk factor. So treatment for kidney stones is something called shockwave lithotripsy. We talked about it with the gallstones. This is ultrasonic waves to try to break up the kidney stones. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. This picture just gives you a visualization of a kidney, couple of kidney stones. 40% of all women get urinary tract infections. And we'll see, I believe it have, have it later on the slides, that you know women have a small, uh, short urethra. So they much more commonly get urinary tract infections than males that have a longer urethra, right? Because there's a mucous membrane in there with defensins and lysosomes and all the protective stuff that's in mucus. And the longer the bacteria have to travel, you know, the harder it is for the infection to persist. Um, and you can read the symptoms on this. I don't generally test on. The symptoms are pretty straightforward. But I want you to know the difference between urethritis, cystitis, and pyelonephritis. Urethritis is inflammation or infection of the urethra. Cystitis is a bladder infection. And pyelonephritis is a kidney infection. And of course, as they progress, right, from, from urethra to bladder to kidney, they become more severe as well. The trigone, as mentioned in lab, is the area that outlines the openings of the two ureters coming down from the kidneys and the opening of the urethra leaving the urinary bladder. So it's this little triangular area in the bladder. It's also the area where infections tend to persist. Inside the urinary bladder, you have uh, transitional epithelium we talked about in anatomy one, right? Those are those dome-shaped cells that, that distend and stretch. There's also a muscle in there called the detrusor muscle, and that's the muscle. It's a smooth muscle, so it's involuntarily controlled, and that's the muscle in the bladder that contracts to expel urine. You can just visualize the urethra uh, and the trigone on this, as well as the internal urethral sphincter and the external urethral sphincter which we'll be talking about. Now, if you go back to the last picture and look at it, the internal urethral sphincter, it's smooth muscle, which you can't tell from the picture, but it's smooth muscle, which means it's involuntary, but it contracts to open. Usually a sphincter, when it contracts, it, it's closed, right? It relaxes to open. This is different, it contracts to open. So if you, if you were to pull those two areas, like contract those two areas, it would open the urethra. Uh, the external urethral sphincter, this is skeletal muscle, and so again, this is voluntarily controlled if it's skeletal, okay? Here's what I mentioned earlier about the male having a longer urethra. There's actually three parts to it. Prostatic urethra, membranous urethra, and spongy urethra. The female, much shorter urethra, and that's where the increased uh, risk of urinary tract in infections comes from. Now, we said diuresis is formation of urine. It's not urination. Micturition is urination. And there's uh, three events that occur. First, you have contraction of that detrusor muscle, that smooth muscle. The ANS in this picture, by the way, or on this slide, it's just talking about autonomic nervous system. So this is happening you know, without conscious control. It's involuntary. So the detrusor muscle contracts to expel the urine. The internal urethral sphincter also involuntarily uh, through the autonomic nervous system will contract to open. And then you have voluntary control of the external urethral sphincter to open uh, for voiding or urination. Now, micturition for a, an infant, uh, it, it's called reflexive urination. It's almost the same thing we just looked at. So the bladder wall stretch, it activates parasympathetic nervous system. So you get uh, the contraction of the detrusor, just like we saw in the last slide. You get the opening of the internal, anal, uh, sorry, internal uh, uh, urethral sphincter. And then um, the external sphincter, uh, the, the pathways are inhibited, so they don't have control yet over the external sphincter, so automatically uh, urination will occur. There is a couple types of incontinence, which is usually from weakened pelvic muscles. You have stress in incontinence, so uh, like an increase in intra-abdominal pressure will force the urine through that external sphincter due to the weakening of the pelvic muscles. There's also overflow incontinence where the ur urine dribbles uh, when the bladder overfills. Uh, the stress incontinence sometimes is common in uh, pregnant females due to the stretching of, of the pelvic floor and muscles. All right, our last slide. So the frequent micturition in infants is due to the fact that they have less concentrated urine, also small bladders, and we already said that they do not yet have control over the external urethral sphincter, so that voluntary control has not developed yet, so they, they normally have incontinence, right, because they don't uh, have that control over that sphincter yet. 
Uh, another really important key fact here is E. coli accounts for 80% of all urinary tract infections. Uh, another fact about uh, bacteria, streptococcal infections can actually cause kidney damage. So again, these are important things to get treated with antibiotics. And then STDs can inflame the urinary tract. Now, urinary tract infections won't affect um, you know, reproductive system or fertility or things like that, but STDs can cause or you know, issues or inflammation in the urinary tract.